Good morning. Good morning, everyone. It's, and it's good to see you all here today. <clears throat> well, we, we've been discussing the Lotus Sutra. The so-called Threefold Lotus Sutra includes the Lotus Sutra proper, preceded by a more or less a prequel or a, a preface <clears throat> called the Sutra of Innumerable Meanings, and and followed by a afterward. called the Dharma pra practice of the sage bodhisattvas. So we, we've been talking about this sutra of innumerable meanings. And the third part of that sutra, which we'll discuss today is called 10 blessings, 10 blessings. The um, translation of this blessings is for me kind of curious because I notice not being a Chinese scholar that different translators have translated it differently as either blessings or merits or virtues, or effects. This difference in the flavor of those words. Uh, blessings suggest something that you're receiving as a gift. Merits suggest something that you earn, like a merit badge and Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts. Virtues suggest something that you actively try to cultivate. And effects is kind of a neutral term. Cause and effect. But they're talking about the effects of this sutra of innumerable meanings. And it's, it's, um, it's kind of a dialogue between two individuals. Magnificently adorned Bodhisattva is a spokesperson for the other 80,000 Bodhisattvas that are present there at this meeting with the Buddha. And magnificently adorned Bodhisattva is serving as the questioner, whereas the Buddha is responding. And the Buddha has talked a bit about this sutra of innumerable meanings without really expressing clearly what the innumerable meanings are or what the sutra is clearly about. So the magnificently adorned Bodhisattva is wanting more specifics. So in this chapter, entitled 10 Blessings, the questioner starts off this way. World honored one, referring to the Buddha. This sutra is inconceivable. Our only wish is that out of compassion and pity for all people, you fully explain the profound and inconceivable matters of this sutra. World honored one, 
from where does this sutta, sutra come? Where is it headed? Where will it live? Having such innumerable blessings and amazing powers, how does this sutra enable people to attain supreme awakening quickly? Because that was the promise that the sutra would enable people to attain supreme awakening quickly, not over the course of eons and many, many lives. So he asks, where does it come from? Where is it headed and where will it live? So the Buddha responds and spoke to magnificently adorned Bodhisattva. Good, good, my good son, it is so, just as you say, this sutra that I teach is profound. Profound, truly profound. Why? Because it enables people to attain unexcelled awakening quickly. Because hearing it just once, they retain all the teachings. Because it brings great enrichment to all the living. Because those who practice the great direct way do not encounter great difficulties. Good son, you ask where this sutra comes from, where is it headed, where it will live. Now you should listen carefully. This sutra originally comes from the home of all the Buddhas, goes toward the aspiration for awakening of all the living, and lives wherever bodhisattvas practice. This sutra comes like this, goes like this, and lives like this. Thus, having such innumerable blessings and amazing powers, this sutra enables people to attain unexcelled awakening quickly. So, <clears throat> I don't know how satisfied magnificently adorned Bodhisattva was with that response. He has been told already that the sutra is inconceivable. Inconceivable, so beyond concepts. in a sense, beyond words and thoughts that we can formulate into words. The word concept comes from the same Indo-European root as grasp. So the magnificently adorned Bodhisattva was just wanting something a little bit more specific, tangible, something that he could grasp a concept that he could remember. Or maybe a set of concepts that he could put in a list. And even though he was told the, the sutra is inconceivable, he's just wanting to conceive it in some way. And he's saying out of pity or compassion for all people, because not everybody is going to be able to accept an inconceivable thing. So trying to get more specifics, he asks about where does the sutra come from? Where is it headed? And where will it live? And the Buddha responds, it comes from the home of all Buddhas, goes toward the aspiration for awakening of all the living and lives wherever bodhisattvas practice. And what is the home of all Buddhas? What's, what's he referring to there? Well, we don't know for sure, but what might it be? I 
And surely he's not talking about just some specific domicile. Could be talking about the divine abode. There is a sutra, or a sutta rather, in the Pali canon about the divine abode, which has with a list of four virtues, basically. And the first being metta, or loving kindness, or simply love. The second being karuna, compassion. The third being mudita, which is taking joy in the well-being of others. And the last is upeka, equanimity. So maybe that's where, maybe that's where Buddhas live. That's their home. Or maybe the home of all Buddhas is the heart mind of each person. We don't know for sure, it's mysterious, it's hard to grasp, and maybe that's the point. But then the Buddha goes on in answering the second question. Where is it headed? It's toward the aspiration for, all, for the awakening of all living. The aspiration, the intention, the desire for all beings to be awakened, aware. You had mentioned that being inconceivable doesn't mean that it is beyond all awareness, because some things that one is aware of cannot be communicated with words or concepts. I think in that case, we often resort to the indirect use of words, such as poetry or song, to try to communicate what concepts just can't contain. So the aspiration for awakening, awareness of all the living. And the third question, where will it live? It lives. Wherever, wherever bodhisattvas practice. So it lives where we live as we go through our lives, as we play our part. That is where the sutra lives and maintains life, comes alive. But then the Buddha wants, sort of changes the topic. He doesn't want to get into it any further. He wants to leave, leave you right there. And he says, good son, would you rather hear how this sutra has 10 amazing powers of blessing or not? Well, what are you going to say? So it, the uh, magnificently adorned Bodhisattva, of course, says, oh, yes, we want to hear this. And then the Buddha starts. Good sons, first, this sutra leads a not yet awakened Bodhisattva to aspire to awakening. It leads one without human kindness to aspire to kindness. It leads one with a murderous heart to aspire to great compassion. It leads one who is jealous to aspire to respond with joy. It leads one with attachments to acquire to impartiality. It leads one who is greedy to aspire to generosity. 
It leads one who is full of arrogance to aspire to be moral. It leads one who is angry to aspire to patience. It leads one who is lazy to aspire to perseverance. It leads one who is distracted to aspire to meditation. It leads one who is ignorant to aspire to wisdom. It leads one who lacks concern for saving others to aspire to saving others. Leads one who commits the 10 evils to aspire to the 10 good things. Leads one who is willful to aspire to let things be. Leads one who is prone to backsliding to aspire to never retreat. Leads one who is who commits faulty acts to aspire to being faultless. Leads one who suffers from afflictions to aspire to detachment. Good sons, this is called the first amazing power of blessings of this sutra. Notice that the power of the sutra isn't to create kindness or create great compassion, but it creates the aspiration for, the aspiration for these things. So in a sense, this paragraph just establishes a direction for many of the afflictions that we all face. And just one more little section, what, because I think it helps reinforce a point. Good sons and daughters, the third inconceivable power of blessing of this sutra is this. If living beings can hear this sutra even once, even only one verse or phrase, they will master a hundred thousand myriad meanings. Even though they still have afflictions, it will be as if they do not. Even though they move through birth and death, they will not know fear. They will have compassion and sympathy for all the living. They will be brave in following all the teachings. Just as a powerful man can easily shoulder and hold heavy things, the same is true of anyone who embraces this sutra. They can bear well the heavy treasure of unexcelled awakening and carry the living out of the way of birth and death on their backs. Even though they cannot yet save themselves, they will be able to save others. Even though they cannot yet save themselves, they will be able to save others others. This is um, the, this, the Mahayana tradition in some ways is interpreted as an antidote to some of the rigidity that seems to be incorporated in the early Buddhist teachings. and could be stifling. Now, the teachings are, of course, interpreted in different ways. And maybe at that time, the interpretation of these teachings was indeed stifling, inciting this rebellion of thought that we call the Mahayana tradition. And maybe it was concern about the notion of perfectionism that seemed to be incorporated in the early teachings, that someone had to give up all their worldly desires, give up all their worldly possessions, 
and be ordained and devote their entire lives to the study of Dharma and to meditation in order to hope to achieve some level of awakening. In this sutra suggests that you don't have to be perfect in order to be beneficial. It goes on with the fourth inconceivable power. If living beings can hear this sutra even once, even only one verse or phrase, they will become brave. And even though they cannot yet save themselves, they will save others. Together with bodhisattvas, they will become part of the entourage of the Buddha Tathagatas. So you don't have to be perfect to be on the team. And in fact, maybe our very imperfections can be used as fuel for kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. I think the tone of the Lotus Sutra throughout is one of inclusiveness and reassurance. And these passages to me suggest everyone is invited to be on the team. You don't have to be perfect. Just have some reverence for these teachings and try to play your part. And that is fact is in fact how the Dharma lives. So I, th I think I'll stop there and um, I guess questions might be, again, this is my take on some of these passages, but they have innumerable meanings. And so I invite you to contribute your own. So where does the sutra come from? Where does it, where is it going and where does it live? What is the home of Buddhas? What does it mean to save beings? What does that really mean? And how does it live through the practice of bodhisattvas? Who are these bodhisattvas? Are they us? So we'll break into um, groups. Uh, thank you very much for listening today. And we'll see you in a short time.